So right now, community is one of the main focal points that comes up again and again. Anytime I'm either talking or connecting with people, or even when I'm tuning in, when I'm tuning in, when I'm getting intuitive insights, when I'm meditating, the topic of community is coming up so much right now because I perceive, and I think many of us perceive this, we are on this brink of really, truly understanding how we operate, not only as individuals, but as a collective. Now, there's a lot of people who have, you know, talked about this at different times, have talked about how, you know, we're all one, we're all unified, we're all a collective. But what I have seen, what I've experienced, and what I think many of us have experienced as well is when we are actually operating from our natural state of being, we literally do synchronize the entire, all of humanity will start to synchronize as a collective field while still retaining our individuality. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we can dive into that thread because it's an interesting paradox and it's what we're right now on the precipice of. I believe that as well. Yeah. Yeah. This is simultaneous dance between um, your individual self, which we always have, but also knowing that we're all in it together. And it's this, the glory of the capital S self and the lowercase s self working in tandem with each other. And uh, yeah, that's the essence of community. And it's almost like we're building a new community, you know, because there's always been a community. There's always been the human tribe at a collective within our various sub tribes that we have, but there's always community, no matter what, you know, that's just being human. We got to get along with each other, but now it seems like we're establishing something different, especially online. We're establishing yes. communities that are like on this wavelength. And that's something different. Like to know that we're to actually know and resonate with and work with the fact that, Hey, we're all in it together. Let's try and get along in this thing, you know? Community is based on love, <laughs> essentially. It is, you know, it's a very, it, so it's, it's a very foundational way for us to exist. Like it's something that's almost, I won't say almost primal within us. It's like, it's, it's a seed of where we originated and we see community like in nature as well. For example, take trees. Forests are essentially communities. You know, they're tree communities. Community. Tree communities. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> with with mycelium, right? The mycelium wow. also interconnecting the community. There's all of nature's ecosystems are, are built on these interconnected communities, right? You have the tree communities, you have certain animal collectives, you have certain plant collectives, but the ecosystem itself is made up of these interwoven communities. It's a network. And exactly like a network. And, and what's so interesting is each network fulfills a, a different sort of role within mm -hmm. the community, but then they all they all build on and interface with each other for the flourishing of the whole. Yeah. Yeah. And what's so interesting is if, if we look at the perceived pattern of humanity, you know, where we can, we can just take this theory of there was the times of more, you know, tribal, separate, nomadic experiences. And now we have expanded into a very global interconnected experience. And what I'm perceiving is happening again is now we're kind of coming back. So we've kind of gone from this apex of very, very global where we're seeing, excuse me, where we're seeing like the internet's connected us, the technology's connected us, you know, we're able to communicate with everyone any place at any time. And now we're coming back to a place where we're I'm I am seeing people come back to some localized community kind of interactions where it's like now that we've had this interconnection of the global space, people are coming back to their community space and they're going, OK, well, how can I create effective connections and collaborations here that then plug into the greater whole? So it's plug almost like grid. we've gone to this big 
mass, this yeah. big blob. But now we're kind of coming back to like these little things that interconnect with the bigger thing. Mm, that went on. But now it's like starting to find a little centralization within the many communities, but they still ultimately do connect to the greater community, the human Sangha, you know, everybody, 7 billion. I think that's where eventually it's going to lead to what we're all doing this for is that we all establish this giant community that has within it many communities, which we have now, they're called countries or towns or cities, but I just think they're going to be different. You know, it's just going to be different. It's not going to be like nation states and governments and stuff like that. The community of the future, I can't even begin to describe it, to be honest, but it's not going to be how it is now with lines drawn of, you know, this is Canada, this is the United States, this is Mexico. You can't cross that without the right papers. It's not going to be like that because those essentially are just communities, right? But it's different now with the internet. The internet has changed up what a community really is. It's non-localized. It's something that's like in the ethers somehow. And we have these communities that, you know, someone can be from Japan, someone can be from the United States, someone can be from Africa. But yet the community is based upon ideals and it seems to be based upon like a certain wavelength that people yeah. are on and certain intentions that people are on. And I think that's the main difference of the communities of the past in the communities of the future is this more of this mental construct and as we go further and further into the matrix per se as the internet evolves and technology um evolves itself it's we're going to evolve what it means to be with each other here what it means to be a human being ultimately and what it means to be a human being collectively in this whole thing and i think ultimately point of the story is it's going to become non-local essentially what we're doing right now is proof of what I'm just what I'm saying, where this is non local conversation, it seems like it's um, nothing to us, because we literally have it in our pockets at all times. But think about it, it's magic. This is insanity. I'm speaking to you from miles and miles away. This is wild. But this is just the state of things in the state of the future, I feel with community non local. I it's well, it's funny, because I feel that too while simultaneously being local. So it's like a paradox. Yeah, because you and did explain that, right? You said it was going to be more local. I think, yeah, I don't think um, it's going to negate locality. I think locality is still going to be a thing, obviously, because we're still in, we still have locality in these bodies. Like there's still, you know, the play of these bodies. But I think there is going to always be locality, but branching out from that is the non-local aspect to it. As in, yes. I know this person that has a church they have local gatherings, but then they also um, they also broadcast it online and people tune in. So it's like local, yes. but yes, now the non-local is getting into it. And that's where it's getting, getting fun. That's where the fun starts. <laughs> that's exactly what I feel. Well, it's, it's simultaneous because yep. like we had very local and then the internet brought us to this place where we could like you said connect magically like with everyone everywhere yeah and now it feels like we are able to ground both simultaneously your your friend your example of your friend is perfect like mm -hmm. that is what it sends it's like so it's like we have localized communities but then they're interconnecting and serving with and connecting to the whole yeah so you have the balance of having like the physical local connected communities, which I think a lot of people, and I can speak, you know, for myself, there's a lot of times that, you know, I grew up in LA and I grew and I traveled a lot and I wasn't always connected with my neighbors or the places that I was in. And more recently, I have found myself choosing to connect locally where I'm living out here in the Pacific Northwest. And as a result, I'm starting to do some more in-person workshops. I'm starting to find people who are interested here. And those interactions help me deepen and amplify the work that I put out in the internet. So there's like this interesting, there's this interesting experience you can only get in person that's an amplified when you do, you know, the magical interconnected interweb stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that's what ultimately technology and the internet is for. It's just a really grand addition to the lifestyle of being a human, you know, our locality. 
it's uh, adds a yeah. sort of non-locality to it. But then you got to think like, okay, that's right now. That's 2024. Where is this really going? Because just released what last week, two weeks ago was the Apple Vision. Is that what it's called? Have you seen that? The augmented yes. reality Apple Vision. <laughs> that's a game changer. So when everybody's wearing some kind of goggles or glasses to put themselves into some kind of reality that is essentially not there, um, are we going to be localized as much at a collective level? Probably not. There will be some stragglers like us that do, um, that do find great value in having localized communities and you know i think that's just a product of the time we were born in and how old we are but what about the future generations are they even going to know the value in localized conversation i don't know i don't think so to be honest with you i think we're moving i hate to say it because it's a buzzword we're literally moving into something that is akin to the matrix where people really aren't going to have conversations with each other anymore and i think that's generations from now we might not see that. We might be like 80 or 90. And they'd be like, come on, grandpa. What do you mean having a conversation in real life? Don't you know, we just put on our glasses and we meet. And then I'll be like, back in my day, we actually <laughs> talk to each other face to face. But who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying though? Like, where is this all going? Is this eventually all going to be non-local? Maybe not everybody, but I do see a vast majority of people. I mean, I see it nowadays. Just mm -hmm. simply yeah. not, uh, not talking to people face to face, like not having actual interactions with human beings, and that is a little scary. And I don't know if there's anything we can do about it, but yeah, what do you mm -hmm. think? Okay, cool. Yeah, I have a few perspectives on that, which is really interesting because I do agree. Like we see a lot of that, and if we were to look at the trajectory as is, it, it definitely would seem like, oh wow, we're going to like a more and more always connected yet disconnected society, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here's the interesting thing. And, and, and I'll speak from it from this perspective that we, we have had, like, especially within the last 20 years, we've had certain really profound, I'm going to call them catalytic points, right? You could say it's something like, uh, like 2012 could be considered a catalytic point. Mm -hmm. um, 2020. I would say 2020 is a catalytic point. And we have a few of these lined up. Um, even what I have been sensing, what I've heard a few other people sense is somewhere around 2027, there's also an interesting catalytic point coming up. And I would oh. say that what we're experiencing is a little bit of the pendulum swing. And no matter, no matter how it goes, whether we were just going to go super local or super global, the polarities balance themselves out one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I am, at least what I am perceiving with all of this is the internet and a lot of this globalization is, I like to call it like almost like a te tele telepathy prosthetic. Mm, <laughs> the internet yeah. is almost like a prosthetic for telepathy, right? Yeah. Because it, it, it's like, it's a, think about it. It's like, I'm not here, but I can like, you know, text Gary and be like, hey man, like, let's like check out this or through this. And you're like, wow, I'm doing that. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of this or I'm interfacing with you. And although for us, oh yeah, that's technology. In a way, that's what telepathy is as well. Yeah. That's like, you know, I'm, I'm communicating with you beyond time and space without physicality. This is to, telepathy. This much. is telepathy, right? Like we're, we're, we're doing this, but it's a, it's a prosthetic in a way. Yeah. There's. You know, and I'm sure you've experienced this before, but I've also experienced a thing where I think of someone, they think of me, and like we kind of text near the same time. We're like, I was just thinking of you. And oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Like a lot of this, that's a real lot telepathy. of this, <laughs> that's real telepathy. Exactly. And the interesting thing is, is I have perceived that a lot of, and, and at the same time, you know, people talk about the internet and like, oh, there's no privacy, there's no this. Well, what do you think happens when you're interconnected with the entire human race and we're all, feeling and sensing each other and we can communicate like this in a lot of ways, this interconnectivity is a sort of, I, I see it as almost like putting your feet slowly in the hot tub and getting used to the temperature. It's like almost preparing us 
for being more interconnected and being able to communicate in these ways yeah. because we're we're arriving at a precipice where it's less like, whoa, that's freaky. I just thought of you. I'm like, oh yeah, of course I just thought of you. We were simultaneously thinking of each other and this is happening and become more and more and more common knowledge to the place where imagine, imagine that we start hitting a, a tipping point where, where texting actually becomes like the slower mode of communication, right? It's more so. clunky. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and what's interesting is at that point, you know, there's a there's an there's this perspective of an interesting tipping point where it's like, yes, technology might keep going this way. But if there's many of us who are actually starting to find that we're synchronizing, which is what this whole concept of meditating, coming into your true self is, is it's not a rejection or an overconsumption of technology. It's understanding technology and these and these resources as tools that could be used to. Um, further deepen or connect or activate or remind ourselves of what is actually possible and what we're capable of. Yeah. And then understanding when the training wheels, I think of like the bike, right? When you have the training wheels at first, you're like, oh, this is amazing. Like I can go, but there's a point where you're like, oh, let me take this off because I can't go faster because the training wheels keep catching on things. Mm -hmm. And you realize now you can move without them. Yeah. <laughs> and that's and I think that's the possible precipice for us with technology without going, you know, you know how we we're talking about potentially going to the over extreme where where it's all super. I think there is part of what I am sensing for this catalytic point is there certain people who do um, navigational readings or navigational insights. So part of the reason I'm, I'm talking in this way is myself, other people, we can sense patterns and trajectories. And you can basically look at the data and look at the cycles, see what's come before and see what is likely based on the momentum and what you are seeing kind of moving forward. It's a bit intuitive. It's a bit data driven. Mm -hmm. And what some, some people, what some people are saying and anticipating here is we are about to come into a position where we're about to be doused with a lot of, let's say, solar energy, solar activity, which may be what starts to trigger some of these things that we're talking about here, like enhance our ability to energetically sense each other or basically bring us online in ways that we haven't been online before, which may be what causes the tipping point that shifts us into something we can't even consider right now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I agree. Yeah. The technology is already developed. It's called the human body. We already have all of that technology. It's just a matter <laughs> if you're tapped into it or not. That's a very good point about the prostheticism of the technology we're building. I think it's almost like we're building it in our image. As they say that we were built in God's image, we're building this being, which I do see AI and technology as a being, in our image and um yeah it's interesting it's just the i don't think most of us know that that's a possibility that we do have this sort of telepathy that you can tap into astral realms etheric realms and get information download information like that it's just a very distant possibility for most people we're not even on the radar at all we don't even know it's a thing but it is a thing, that's for sure. If you tap into yourself enough, you know that yeah, this stuff is real. And the more you tap in, the more it happens. Like the more synchronistic events happen, the more you go into yourself. And uh, yeah, essentially, I think we talked about this in the last one. It just goes to show me that we do really live in a magical reality. Like the, it's just, it just goes beyond belief sometimes, but it really is true that somehow, some way we are all connected all of us, I know that sounds very grandiose, but all 7 billion, how many people are on earth? 8 billion. All of us are this really one mind that is interconnected at all times. But we're cut off from that. We're cut off from that connection. Imagine what the world would look like if we were all connected, all synchronized, all harmonized. If that's the name of the game, synchronization and harmonization. What would the world look like? All of us all in the same synchronization. I can't even imagine. It would be completely transformed. 
I don't even know if that maybe that'd be too much bandwidth, like eight billion people all on the same wavelength. Maybe that would be just too much, too much to handle. I don't know. But all I know, yeah, is the technology is already developed. Doesn't matter if we get Neuralink or Apple Vision or any of that, because we do already have it. But the thing is, is will we get sucked into the technology and have it do all the thinking for us? Because that's what I think is the quite serious possibility is that this stuff will be like a veil on our true capabilities of the human body and the human mind. And we'll get sucked into that too much and for really forget about what the true technology of the body is. And essentially, if we do that, we're going to really forget who we are. And uh, that's where it could get a little tricky and messy. And that's where I, I think while we have the time, while technology hasn't completely enveloped our world, we have to do the work here and become centered within ourselves, within our body, before we get the chip in our brain, which I don't think I'll ever do, to be honest with you, but who knows? And then uh, I think if you can do that, right, and have that understanding within yourself, it doesn't matter what kind of technology is developed. And if anything, you could use that to your best benefit. Like we could even say we're already in the matrix now. Look at what we're doing. What is this? What is this? This is like we're pretty much, we pretty much have the chip. You know, I got it in my pocket rather than in my brain. But the thing is, I'm using it, I think, to the best of my ability to have conversations like this and put out information like this and to also take in information. So it's all about, I think, at the end of the day, how we use this technology. No matter what comes about, it's how we use it and not let it use us because that is currently happening and I think will continue to happen is this technology is thinking for us and using us and essentially we're being sold our attention is being sold into the technology and uh being harvested in a way like our energy is being harvested from it i know i'm not trying to become like pessimistic and dark here but i'm just stating an observation and being realistic like you're either going to have it i feel as though use you or you're going to use it for your best benefit and that's up to you that's part of the the personal journey you know that's up to you what side of the coin you want to be in in that You know what I'm getting at, though? Absolutely. And, you know, that is very true. And and I don't even mean it in like this very, we could take this at a very non-conspiracy way. Like, and I'll speak a little bit, like just as a marketer, because one of my professions, like the last 10 years has been to be a marketer. And what is marketing, but guiding the focus of people's attention towards an outcome. Yep. (laughs) And... Technology, technology, sales, I've had a lot of insight into all these different systems and they are built to guide focus, to inspire action towards a chosen outcome. And if you are not the person deciding where your focus or where your actions are, if you're going along on a passive ride or if you are allowing yourself to be a little bit um, hijacked by your emotions and you are attempting to fix inner feelings by taking outer actions, this is often where the marketing or where anything else can hook you because it's promising you relief from the inner discomfort you feel Mm -hmm. by taking external action versus you being able to be aware of your feeling, being curious about it, and then going within and receiving the inner guidance on what step to take at the moment, if any. And that's that that one key difference. Am I going to try to fix how I feel by doing a thing like, oh, I don't feel good. Let's do a thing. Or am I going to go, yes. Or am I going to go like, okay, I have this intense feeling. Let's sit with it and receive what the message of it is. Yes. Yep. And then make a decision. That's the key pivot right yeah, there. Exactly. Very well said. Yeah. The key is like, do you find that satisfaction? Do you find that? Do you quench your thirst from the outside? Or do you try to at least? Or do you look within to do that and quench this yearning, this thirst that you have? And, uh, you know, the current pandemic of the mind is everyone's looking on the outside or grasping for things on the outside. Maybe this, maybe that, maybe him, maybe her, maybe when I get here, when I look like this, when I have this amount of money. Nope, it's never that. We've all tried it. We've all tried it. 
it's all about going within. And like you said, yeah, you have to get the message. You have to be quiet enough to hear the subtle whispers of intuition that will guide you along the way. But if you're just in the noise of the outside world, you're never going to be able to hear it. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So moral of the story, I guess, is no matter what, it's all about going within. No matter what kind of technology, no matter what's going on the outside, no matter if we have the chip or not, it's all about using the technology right here or right here, depending on how you look at it, both. And then that'll always lead the way. Just my fear, like I stated before, is that we get so lost in the sauce of the technology that we forget what the real technology is, which will happen for some. But I think there will always be the select few like there are now that always know where to look. And it's up to you. It's really up to you what side you want to be on. It's really that simple. Um, yeah. But ultimately, uh, I think it's for the better. I think this technology is for the better. It's for the better. There's always, it's hard to generalize like if it's good or if it's bad. That's so simple thinking. It's all about our personal journey with the technology that we have at our disposal. And ultimately how it affects, getting back to our point, our community altogether, you know, our communities that we have yes. locally and the worldwide community as a whole. Do yes. Think, do you think it's a net benefit though? If we could try to simplify it, like the technology that is being built, uh, AI, I guess, is this a net benefit for us in the end? Is this all how it's supposed to be? Or is this, uh, it's just the mark of the beast coming out, you know? Well, my perspective is everything that we are creating or experiencing, whether it's individually or collectively, is something that whether we're creating individually or collectively, like this is essentially what we are voting into reality. Like what we are experiencing internally and externally is, is a reflection of what we feel <laughs> is the best outcome. I know, which sounds really funny when you see the reflection of what's going on in the world. So to answer your question, we have, and I'm sure many who are listening to this may believe and perceive this, right? There's a lot of talks about previous societies such as Atlantis or Lemuria. Like mm -hmm. there's perspectives that it's not like we just came from, oh, we were only tribal and this is the most advanced we've ever been. There is, and this is a perspective that I attune to through many of the downloads information and just knowings that I have received is that we are more cyclical. We have had times of greater technology and greater advancement than we do now. And so we have been through similar cycles. It's almost like we have collective memories of doing something similar to this. Like I almost want to call it collective deja vu, mm. where in the past we actually have built technologies to enhance our consciousness. So imagine, imagine like being in a point in civilization where we had these technologies, but we were actually attempting to use the technology to enhance our consciousness. Some say that the fall of those civilizations came because we became over-reliant on the technologies mm -hmm. without actually anchoring the consciousness in our bodies. Mm -hmm. So it created a, a tilting point where it wasn't sustainable anymore. Yeah. And we have within our collective psyche, the, the trauma essentially of that cataclysm of that choice. Interesting. So to answer your question, I believe that there's many of us here who are tuned in, who are actually very tapped in to that memory, that remembering of that choice of essentially that collective trauma, you know, that thing where like, well, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. it's somewhere embedded within us. And so as we're as we're taking very similar steps again, because there are similarities here, we're having similar steps because we are actually at the precipice of an evolution and an advancement. The 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 human, the society that we experience um, or that is experienced 200 years from now is something beyond what I am currently going to be voicing here. Like it's something just beyond Mm -hmm. What and you and you and you alluded to this, Gary. You were you were saying something like, "I don't even know what this would look like if everyone was synchronizing." And and I believe and perceive that's where we're headed, and it's vastly different from what we're doing now. And I perceive <clears throat> there is enough of us 
who are both conscious and like listening to this show and listening to similar shows and being aware that as these technologies are being built, we are remembering, oh, yes, this is good, but we are not going to place all of our faith or all of our energy or all of our focus or all of our hopes or completely plug in and disconnect from ourselves into these systems. We are going to leverage these systems. We are going to potentially use these systems where they're going to help enhance our ability to do what our technology, what our what our biological technology can do. And I believe this time, the goal is that if we listen to that inner guidance, we will know exactly how much of the technology to use and when, and we will know how much of the biological and natural technology to use. And if we can walk that tightrope, because it is a tightrope, yeah. that's the thing. It's not technology bad, nature good, or whatever. It is, there is, there is a tightrope that we can walk that is precise and creates this perfect merge of technology serving the natural whole. And that is what I believe those of us who, who perceive ourselves as, you know, whether you want to say light bearers or way showers or, you know, bringing these kinds of insights in, I believe part of our role is to provide that inner guidance so that enough of us can be precise in our individual lives and collectively and walking that pathway that we actually hit this point where we're not, you know, all just plugged into the matrix and we're not also just destroying technology, but we, we have this, this perfect point where, where one serves the other. Mm. And that's and that is the the outcome that I'm attuning to. And I believe that many of us consciously or unconsciously are really rooting for. Amen. Well said. Yeah, Yeah. well said. Clip that one. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I agree. It's like a balancing act and it might get a little messy in the beginning right now because it's so new. We fear the unknown, but I do believe it is ultimately for the betterment of consciousness altogether, the better, betterment of our species altogether. And uh, I think it will always be a thing where we toe the line, where we always have that balancing act within. And that might lead to some tension, like I said, but I think as time goes on, we'll get more attuned to it and we'll get more used to this thing. But it's so new. It's so new. All of this is so new. All of the technology, not even just AI, all of this technology is so new. You know, when I was a kid, and I'm pretty young, but when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet. We had the internet, but it was like localized, it was dial up and it was localized to a specific room in your house and computers were pretty expensive. And we've come so far from that in, you know, 20 or so years. And uh point of my story is it's, it's so new, it's, it's happening so rapidly within all of our lifetimes. It's happening so rapidly and changing so fast. I can see why we fear it and we're so scared of what's happening because I don't think we've ever seen change like this ever in the history of humanity. Maybe in the times of Lemuria in Atlantis, we had some stuff like that. I don't know, but not as far as we know, not in recorded history have we had stuff like this. So I do see why we're like, hey, what's, what's going on? Are we building Skynet? Is this the Terminator? <laughs> Maybe, but I don't think so. I think it's just because we're going through some growing pains and we fear the unknown naturally, but I do think it'll all work out in the end and it'll be for our best benefit if we want it to be. That's the thing. I think it'll always be if you want it to be. You're, you always got to go within no matter what. I think I said that before. Well, yeah. you know, that's the fun thing. Like our inner reality and our inner choices, essentially our inner votes how we focus, and I call votes how we focus individually, collectively on reality, are essentially the vehicle that drives and determines the outcomes of these creations. And, you know, I, I have heard a lot of different, and, and it is, like, I agree, it's it's a lot. The technology is a lot. And then being aware that we're creating something that could, you know, essentially um, permutate and then maybe theoretically self-replicate. And then there's a certain tipping point where maybe 
that's beyond the grasp of our control is a lot. What I have, what I have tuned into, what I have sensed is our best bet in general, whether we're talking about AI technology or anything else that is, you know, unfolding in reality and we want those best outcomes. There is something about, again, our individual and our collective power of focus that will literally influence the world around us. There is a reason why group meditation and group prayer works so well. It really does. This is, and this is one of the reasons why I was even inspired to talk about community at the beginning, because it's not about trying to pray to force things in the past. What has what I have received and understood is there was a point humanity was advanced enough that you could get a group of focused, aware people together to visualize something and bring it in reality. So imagine being able to literally build or construct things when you have, okay, let's grab the hundred people and we're going to make it so. Some say that that may have been how some of the ancient civilizations even worked. Yeah. So coming back into community or synchronization or or coming back into resonance within ourselves is one of the first steps to us coming online with a level of technology that actually out advances AI mm. because it's not coming from a mental place of trying to out compute it mentally. It's coming from this place of, I would say it's a, it's a deeper wisdom and something that the AI and the technology itself wouldn't have access to that actually works beyond time and space. So if AI is like, oh, it's every, you know, it, it halves its time every moment, but if time is irrelevant in the way this is creating, then what does that matter? Mm -hmm. Also, I know this is like a very like expanded concept, but it feels important to share this just as a perspective, because unless we have these considerations for how things could be, we're always attempting to figure things out from a place of, you know, this is the concepts we know that are possible, but there are ways we can operate and move that I believe we are coming into, that we are coming online to. And I believe it's an interesting like chicken or egg thing. Like it's potentially the the technology may inspire a lot of people to address these questions like, wow, how do we how do we do this? And therefore, having that technology brings more people into the awareness of how they might shift into this new way of being. So from that way, you can almost see how how one interfaces or influences the other. And I believe that all these changes we are experiencing rapidly are just a way that we chose to experience this period of <laughs> essentially it's almost like puberty like spiritual puberty right mm -hmm. this how we've chosen to experience this growth spurt um because if it wasn't this if it wasn't ai then it would be just something else it would be something else that would inspire us to to go deeper to to move further to come into our inner technologies and that's and that's a perspective i think that's very valuable to share here for consideration yeah let me ask you this one yes this is a big question Ooh, what do you think okay. is the ultimate goal of life here what are we really doing what are we really building here and you know as 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 a being that seems to have free will, how are we supposed to use this free will? Like what's really going on here? Well, I like to think of our lives in reality as one of the most intense and lore rich creative experience exercises or creative writing exercises, like a very, very involved D and D game. <laughs> so, so essentially this is a video game that we are, <laughs> we are creating as we go like we're creating the game yes what this is this is my experience and i of course invite everyone to tune into what feels right for them but my experience you know when i've sat and contemplated with this question 
is very similar to something Alan Watts once shared. He, he talked about the dream, the dreamers and the dream and the way he explained it, which I think is a, is a great way to sort of summarize this is if you were an all powerful being that could dream whatever you want into reality, maybe you would dream of like all kinds of like, you know, I'm, I have 10 castles and all those castles can teleport and I have wings and I do this and I do this. And, and maybe you would dream all kinds of fun things, but then perhaps eventually you would get bored of those dreams. Like maybe you're doing these dreams for millions of years, who knows, but like eventually you're like, okay, well, what else? And this question of what else, right? If you're an infinite being with eternal time and you can visualize, you can bring anything you want into the, and experience it, eventually you may get to a point where it's, where it's like, well, what if I do this? What if I, what if I do something completely different than this? And the theory then is that our experience of this, because if we're all one, right? We're all just ourself interacting with ourself, playing different roles simultaneously to allow ourselves the joy of an experience. Just like if we daydream, except this is like the most real, real, real daydream we could have. And the greatest purpose I have, I have seen here is to just have as much enjoyment of the experience as possible to do the things that for your individualized experience inspire you to go, oh yeah, I did that. Because each of us is essentially given a sandbox or a playground to a set, to, in a sense, to be able to live our version of our dreams, of our desires, which is why our desires from my perspective are not bad things. Where it gets tricky is when we get when we interface with our desires in a way that tilts us in a way where we are wrestling with them or not giving ourselves permission to have them, mm. that's where it becomes tricky. But if we view our desires as indicators of us living our fullest purpose by giving ourselves permission to have them, then life becomes a little bit playful. And it can be scary because sometimes our desires invite us to step into the unknown or go a little bit off of what we think our mental script is. But when we're taking those steps, those are often the times we feel the most alive and we mm -hmm. feel the most present and we feel the most delighted. Yeah. Hmm. Well said. Well said what do again. you think, Gary? I'm very curious. Well, on your, I like your explanation on your point. It's what is our desires? What are the things that we want? You have your desires. I have mine. We all have our own. What what really are they? Hmm. They're kind of like objectives in the video game in a certain way. It depends how we work yeah. with them. And they're also limitations. If we are all this one God that split itself up into our individuality, we have limitations. You know, in that dream of infinite possibility, there's no limitations and that gets boring. That like you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. So what's really going on here is like here's I'm getting lost in my uh getting lost in my thoughts here. Is we're playing a game of limitation. And we all have our own limitations here to work with, but that's the game. And it's sort of a, an adventure in that way. It's an adventure game, you know? It is like D&D. It's like an RPG in a way. It's an adventure game. So maybe a horror game for some. It's hard to say. But it is some kind of game. And we all are playing in our own sandbox for sure. It's all the same game at the end of the day. It's all the same. We're all player one. But there is the game aspect always. There is that sort of play and how we play with our limitations here. And I think that's the point. And more so is we create through our limitations amidst the seeming entropy that we have in this game. We create despite that. And that, yes, is somehow an experience of joy. I feel as though finding that knack of creativity within all of our beings, all of our souls, and embracing that and going with that and whatever flavor it comes about in our life is joy there's something about being human that alludes to creation 
And we all, the beauty of it, the beauty of it, we all have our own dharma in creation, right? That's the beauty of this play. Is I create my way, you create your way. And in that we create this beautiful, seemingly like a mandala, some kind of just beautiful artwork, the artwork of God, maybe a song you could even say, song that we're playing as we go. And that's it, that's the point of life. There's no other point, it's just to get lost in creation. And not even for creating something at an end goal, right? Because that is an attachment. Like I'm creating to get something or I'm creating to get to a certain place. Like, no, you just get lost in the journey of creation. We've all heard that the journey is the destination, but that cliche is the truest of the true. It is just simply get lost in the flow of creation here in whatever way that you can, in whatever way that you resonate with. Because we, we all have a, a lot of... Um, capabilities to explore different facets of creation within our being but i feel as though we all have certain knacks we all have certain things niches that we're we're good at here so i think that's that's the point of life man i don't know how else to say it and then ultimately i think it all alludes to creating something that is not only better for yourself but better for the world altogether if you can create something that is better for the uppercase self and the lowercase self i think that's really what it's all about it's as simple as that man it's as simple as that. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> well said. Creation, art for art's sake, you know. And well said. On that point of technology, you have to ask yourself, does this technology that we have that is being developed every single day, it is getting more intrusive in our lives. Does that aid your path and pursuit of creation here? Or does it hamper it? Does it make you more of a consumer? You get sucked in and you just want to view other people's creation or do you use it to your best ability to create a beautiful life and a beautiful piece of art or pieces of art from it? That's the question you have to ask yourself. And my next question on that note is like, I like to see life as art. You know, it's the art of living. Thich Nhat Hanh wrote that book. I like it. It's a very great saying. Well, what is art? How would you describe what art is? Because if, if, if you agree that life is a sort of art, as I do, then what would we really call art? Because that's something that's very human, I feel, that machines can't really do. I mean, we do have, I don't know, that's a debate. We do have AI art, and some of them are very, very good. But I feel as though the inspiration of art truly comes from that deep wisdom within that you spoke of. So what, what is art? How could we explain that? It's a great question, Gary. You know, I, I thought about that before because in my own life, um, I do paintings, I do poetry. And, you know, I have created some very cool pieces, like pieces where I'm like, oh, wow, that's really cool. But every now and then something comes out that I create that comes from a space that I would say is raw, that is true. And when I'm creating that art, it becomes almost a transmission, uh, an expression of something so vulnerable and real and honest mm -hmm. that it almost transcends a concept of what I think I want to create. And it is simply an expression of whatever is the most true in that moment. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think sometimes of songs, right, where the artist was some of the songs that move us the most, the artist was singing, voicing something that was deep in their experience that is so that is so raw and real that even if you don't have their direct experience, it might resonate somewhere deep within you where yeah. you understand it. And it yeah. I feel real art is almost is an interconnected medicine that all of us understand at a core level, whether or not you understand the surface presentation of it. Yeah, exactly. That's it, hard. Yep. It almost transcends time and space, as we spoke of before, in a way it is sort of telepathic. Really good art is emotionally telepathic. And it lasts, you know, it lasts beyond the moment of creation. It lasts beyond the creator. And there's something so poignant about very good art. Like you look at Renaissance art, that's thousands of years old, but it still hits. Or you listen to a really good song, it still hits. You know, you listen to some 60s, 70s music, 
it's like, oh, you feel the emotion of that time of the creation in that moment. Yeah, that's really good art. So if our living is an art form, what we're what we're extending upon, what are, what are we doing here? We're creating something that outlasts us, ideally. And in that is purpose, is meaning. And uh, that's what we all want, right? That's all what we yearn for is to create something, I believe, that outlasts us because we all have that idea of, um, uh, you know, our limited lifespan here. And it's all in the back of our heads. So I think how we find a little sense of fulfillment and purpose in this life is find something that you can get lost in in the moment that will transcend you, almost like a little extension of you that will last generations. Some people, it's children. You know, I think that's a lot of our creative uh, knacks, if not all of us, or most of us, at least, is children. That's at least one facet of our creativity that outlasts us. But I do believe also we can create much more than that, that outlasts all of us. And in a way, that's how we live forever, as we live through each other's art forms and however that comes into being. And the beauty of art, I think it always transforms. As technology transforms, art transforms. And there's always new artists born every day. That's the beauty of this thing. You know, there's only going to be one Michael Jordan. There's always only going to be one Da Vinci. There's only going to be one Gary Haskins. <laughs> but there'll be somebody even greater than that in the future that won't even touch how great these people were in the past. And I think that's the beauty of it is like as we go on, the art keeps getting better and better and more novel. It's, it's beautiful. I don't think the art ends, you know, the art never really ends. Even if we do have AI art, I think that's something that's so pivotal about the human condition is that we're like siphoning something because that's what art is, right? When you feel it, when you're in the moment, right? Think about it. You're in the moment. It's like it's coming from somewhere else. It's like, where am I getting this download? It's it's like, where, who, why, and where is this coming from? You're siphoning from somewhere else. And I think that's constant no matter what time period we're in. If we're in the Renaissance or we're in 2500, there's always going to be that intuitive transmission of, yeah, siphoning information, essentially, emotional, uh, emotional transference, it seems that we can download and implant into this life. And it's up to you if you want to do it. You don't have to, but I think that's kind of the purpose of life is we create through that connection, through that bridge to the other side, per se, if you want to call it that. And in that creation, you kind of imprint yourself here in a way, but not for selfish reasons. It's just because you truly enjoy doing it. If you do it for selfish reasons, I actually think that is counterintuitive and you create bad art, if you create out of the ego, you're not going to get good art. I think it's true good art is egoless for sure. But um, do you know what I'm getting at? Am I am I just rambling here or do you understand? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm on the ride with you, Gary. I, I feel it. I feel it. And it's, I love how you pointed out, you know, the the art we create with our lives which I think ties back to what you were asking, or at least what you invited when we talked about what's the point of existence. And I think that whenever, you know, there's, there's so many people who are like, well, what's my purpose? Or there's this like drive to maybe like make a book or, or, or be famous or do something so they can leave an imprint. But I believe what you and I are talking about is sort of the, the the gem, the gold, the little secret that everyone has in their lives, which is that everyone is ultimately built to prosper in their deepest form of art, like their actual yeah. deepest desire, like mm -hmm. whatever it is they choose to express. And if you can listen to that guidance, and if you can trust the seed of your desires, and you can take the inspired action that comes from your intuition, life can actually unfold in this not only beautiful journey for you, but the act of living your life becomes an inspirational art form. Mm -hmm. The act of living your life, you know, you know, have you see when you see someone who's like truly just enjoying 
their experience of life. It doesn't matter if they're like, oh, they're a famous TV star or like maybe they are just like a maybe they're like an elementary school teacher, but maybe they just love what they do. And they Mm -hmm. they come to work and they dress up and they light up all the kids lives and every single kid loves the teacher and they won't stop talking to the parents about it. And then they inspire rooms of children who remember them years later and then bring those teachings out into the world. The, the the echoes and patterns that that one life created, whether or not, you know, people remember the specific name yeah. may yeah. actually live for hundreds or thousands of years Forever. through the echoes of the lives they touched mm-hmm. as, well a, as a work of art. Yep. Yeah. Very true. It's very true. Wow. Damn. Yes. Oh, I had something. I had something I was going to ask, but it completely went out the window because <laughs> it wasn't meant to be. <laughs> uh, that's okay oh, i felt okay. it i got it this is uh it's so essentially yeah it's about also this whole treating your life as a work of art yes it's really about living in an inspired way and actually wanting to live actually loving one's life i feel as though that's the key and however we create however it comes about whatever shape or size whatever flavor it comes about into our life it's really just about loving life. It's that simple. It's not about the end product. Like you said, it's not about having your name remembered, even though that might happen. It's not about even really wanting to have something outlast you because that is also a thing of the ego. No, it's truly about just being here and now and loving yes. your life. It's just finding that creative inspiration, that creative flow. It leads to really just wanting to be here man and i think that's what we're all yearning for a good majority of us are yearning for that wanting to be here amidst the struggle and the darkness and the suffering it's it's found in our creative knack however it comes about it's found in our creativity that's the most important part this whole thing yes yeah and you know something i feel inspired to to share to talk about some of the different threads that we played with, like where it came to community, where it came to, um, you know, collective technology, AI, where it, where it came to living your life as a work of art. What I, what I think the invitation here is for people is the more that you trust yourself to live your life with your desires as that work of art and express yourself in that way, the more you magnetize people who resonate with your style of art, with your work of art, the more you find and connect with your community, whether it's local or whether, whether it's global. And then the more all together, there is a certain kind of art that's created when we work alone. But then when we, when we come together, Mm. the way we create may turn into a form of art that is many multiple times the sum of the individual parts. Yeah. And I believe that's the synchronization we are headed towards when we are being genuine with ourselves. And I believe that is part of the, the tipping point. That is part of in our uniqueness. We actually, it's not about because, because coming together isn't about all being the same. It's, it's quite the opposite. Mm. It's about being completely and totally who you are resonating with the people that mix with that and then in your place in reality we somehow all interconnect even if you over here would not get along with the person over here it doesn't matter because you're in this space here interconnecting in a way that is actually harmonious for the whole and in that way you can have complete opposites experience being part of the whole while still essentially being harmonious Hmm. yeah i think that's where we're going separate so. yet equal yes. separate yet together in a cohesive manner some kind of decentralized network that is uh less attuned to competition and more toward cooperation because we're a little bit on the competitive side you know <laughs> that's just in our loins i think that's just where we come from but i think we're slowly moving toward cooperation there's all there always be com- competition friendly competition maybe Yes. Uh, yeah, I think yeah. I think competition can be like like for example, we like to play sports, you know, which is like a friendly competition, but I I think like with everything, it's just about having the vehicles that are 
that are, I, I guess I could say the word healthy, like it's about creating containers, vehicles, pathways of expression for these kinds of energies, rather than like attempting to demonize the energies. It's going mm-hmm. like, oh yeah, we're competitive or sometimes we're intense or sometimes we're fiery. And like, here's the ways, here's the ways that we get to express that through our different art expressions of life. Mm-hmm. Amen. <sighs> Danielle, you are a very well-spoken individual. Um, you're an awesome person. I'm glad I know you. I'm glad you came on here. I think we can probably start to wrap this thing up. We've said a lot. Um, do you have anything else you want to say? Any last words for the pod? Yes, just that I also feel the same, Gary. I'm so appreciative of our friendship, our connection. And I'm also so appreciative of connecting with everybody who has tuned in. I uh, I feel like what we are doing here is, at least for me, one of the forms of art in my life. So I want to take that moment to appreciate you and everyone for participating in this awesome, awesome art that we did. <laughs> Amen. Namaste to that. Um, yeah, I do see this as an art form in a way. Um, I mean, it is really just us talking, but I don't know. It's a little more than talking. It seems there is, there is that sort of flow that comes about in these conversations. And that's what I do it for because I truly enjoy it. It's really that simple. I truly enjoy tapping in with people like you and having these because it it helps me grow and it helps me see life differently and just, I don't know, live a better life altogether. So hopefully you feel it. Hopefully the people that listen feel the same as well. Either way, I feel it. And uh, I thank you for coming on here and helping me and aiding me and my side in, in that way. So yeah, keep on keeping on, Danielle. Uh, you're an awesome person. I already said that. Um, that's it. I don't have anything else to say. Peace and love to you. I wish you all the best. And uh, peace and love to everybody. Now listen this long. I love you all. Thanks, Gary.